more than a hundred years ago, Sister Nivedita emphasized this, that it begins with sensory experience, it begins with the concrete, and then it goes to abstract knowledge. She speaks about, very interesting insight she gives about uh, education. She speaks about training of the feelings and training of choice. Training of feelings and training of choice. That unless we train the feelings and unless we train a person to choose, the, our, she says, our student has learned certain intellectual tricks that will enable him to earn his bread, but it cannot, uh, it, it, uh, she says, he cannot ap appeal to the heart nor give life. So to inspire, you need training of the feelings and training of choice. I want to stop here and consider this for a while. She does not give so much importance to training of the intellect, but training of emotions and training of decision making, of choice. Just a little while ago, I was speaking with Professor Sain about some of the latest work going on in economics. Dan, Professor Daniel Kahneman, he got the Nobel Prize for Economics uh, few, uh, several years ago. He has written a very popular book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And Professor Sen has already read it, but I am not ready, it's still it's sitting on my desk in, in, in uh, Manhattan. But the central idea for which he got the Nobel Prize was that in economic, in life, not only in economics, in life decisions are not ma made actually by rational choice. Often decisions are made by intuition. Often decisions are guided by feelings. This connection between irrationality and decision making, between emotion and choice has become a central focus for economics today. Many students are going from uh, India to western universities to work in economics and the field is this not the old kind of mathematical economics but the new kind of economics where the connection between decision making and feelings Sister Nivedita pointed this out more than a hundred years ago that in education training of the feelings, training of intuition and decision making is very important you see let's think about this we know many things but it's very difficult. One of the biggest problems in our life is translating what we know into our life. What we know, what we have studied, what we have understood, what we have agreed is good. How to implement that in life? If you go to any bookshop, you will find these self-help sections. Uh, how to become, uh, how to, um, you know, become rich in seven days, how to uh, overcome an anxiety, how to uh, get friends, how to be successful in life, and so many wonderful uh, The <coughs> shelves are packed with these books. And these are best sellers. Now, if we could implement even 5% of that, our life would be blessed. But somebody told me, Swami, I have read many of these books useless. Why? The ideas are good. But it has no effect on my life. We know so many things. But how can we change our life with those, th with those ideas? It's very difficult. Why is it difficult? There's a, uh, a psychologist in America right now, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. He, he has worked on this. This gap between knowledge and doing, abstract knowledge and transformation of life. Why is this gap there? He has written a book called The Happiness Hypothesis. It sounds uh, very, uh, you know, superficial, but actually it's a very nice book, very, very deep, well thought out book. He says, why is it that we can learn many things, we can understand many things, we agree to many things, but we can't implement in our lives? Why not? For example, I agree it's very good to get up early in the morning and do meditation. Or to be very good to get up early in the morning and finish my studies. I will study two hours in the morning before everybody else gets up. Some decision like that. I agree. Next day in the morning what happens is very cold. <laughs> it's very cold here also in New York. Yesterday was, uh, somebody asked me, how cold is it in New York? I said, when I came it was not very cold, about minus 7, minus 8. I said, oh that is not cold, minus 7, minus 8. Uh, so it's very cold in the morning. 
and when you have to get up, it's very difficult to come out of uh, the blanket. Under the blanket, very difficult to come out. You shut, shut, shut up the uh, alarm, alarm clock and go back to sleep. Why? You have decided that I will get up in the morning and finish my studies early in the morning. But when the time comes, you don't get up. Why? The difference is this. Jonathan Haidt explains it with a nice model. The model of an elephant and mahout. You know what a mahout is? The person who sits on the elephant and controls the elephant. He, uh, he says, the mahout controls the elephant. The mahout knows where uh, he has to, the elephant has to go. So mahout, has, we can, the mahout can read a map or to, these days GPS is there. Huh? So the mahout can guide the elephant uh, to go from point A to point B. Elephant cannot read a map. An elephant cannot read the map. The mouth wants to take the elephant from here to there. Now he will be successful if the elephant agrees. If the elephant does not want to go, who is stronger? Elephant or mouth? Elephant. Elephant is much stronger. Mouth cannot drag the elephant. Elephant has to agree that I will go from here to there. If elephant does not agree, mouth cannot do anything. If elephant wants, if the elephant wants to go to the nearby shop and get bananas and eat bananas, <laughs> the mouth cannot stop the elephant. Elephant is much stronger. What's the relevance of this model? Uh, Professor Jonathan Haidt says, we are like that elephant and mouth. When you read something that it is good to get up early in the morning and do meditation on your studies and you agree, who agrees? The intellect agrees. Buddhi, the intellect agrees. Yes, tomorrow I will get up early in the morning and study. Good. Next day in the morning, when you have to get up, who has to get up? Not the intellect. Buddhi. Body has to get up. And the body says, I did not agree to get up. It is your plan. Body will say to the intellect, it, you are not suffering from the cold, I am suffering from the cold, so I will not get up. And the intellect has no power to drag the body out. So that's what happens to us. We understand many things with our intellect. We make many plans with our intellect. But the execution does not depend so much on the intellect as on emotion and feeling and on the, on the, on the, on the senses on the body. So this gap is there between the mouth and the elephant. The mouth understands knowledge, books. We, we, it under, we understand, intellect enjoys seminars, workshops like this. Body is not interested in workshop. Body is not interested in seminar. What, so, so what does the elephant respond to? You can't explain it to the elephant. You have to train the elephant. That is Jonathan Haidt's conclusion. You have to train the elephant. Elephant responds to training, not to persuasion, not to books, not to ideas. Training is important for the elephant. If the elephant is well trained, then the elephant will respond to the commands of the mahout. In the same way, if our, if our emotions are trained, if our senses are trained, if our body is trained, then what you decide and understand by the intellect, you'll be able to implement through the body and, and, and the emotions. So, Sister Nivedita, hundred years ago, training of feeling and choice. Look at the word she uses, choice. Decision making. We make many decisions. New Year's resolution. Many New Year's resolution. First of January, second January failed. <laughs> Why? The training of decision making has not been done. How to implement the decisions in our day to day life. Recently, there's a book which has become very popular in USA now. Robert Wright, uh, who is a Darwinian atheist, well known writer, who lives very close to New York in Princeton. He has written this book, uh, Why Buddhism is True. And there he writes, Many insights I have got from. Darwinian, uh, applying uh, Darwinian theory to psychology. I understand many things. Why I take these uh, decisions. Why, for example, I like sugar. So there is a Darwinian reason uh, why we have a tendency to eat sugar. But I, now I know it's bad for my health. I know it's bad for my health. But he says I cannot resist a sugar-coated donut. Uh, 
Why not? Same question. The mouth and the elephant story. Robert Wright writes that. And then he says how spiritual practices, meditation, it can help in order to train our emotions and our decision making. He says the western model has been dominated by Plato's uh, chariot model where the idea was the driver of the chariot, the rider in the chariot who controls the chariot. If the rider knows where he wants to go, he can guide the chariot there. If you know what you want, to know what is good is to be good. That was the idea. And Robert Wright says, that's so evidently false. I know what is good, but I can't be good. I can't translate my knowledge into, into action. Uh, this is a very ancient thing. It was very, very well understood uh, in Indian psychology. When Krishna went to Duryodhan, when Krishna taught Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, Somebody said he should have taught it to Duryodhan, then the Mahavar war would have been prevented. But Krishna actually tried to teach Duryodhan. We know the story. Krishna tried to teach Duryodhan. Krishna told Duryodhana that what you are doing is adharma, bad. And this is dharma, this is adharma. You should not follow the path of adharma, follow the path of dharma. <coughs> and what did Duryodhan reply? Crucial insight. What Jonathan Haidt is saying today. Duryodhan replied at that time in Mahabharata, he said, Don't teach me dharma and adharma, I know. <laughs> Janami dharma, natyame pravritti. I know what is right, but my problem is, not that I do not know, knowledge I have got, but my, I know what is right, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> Janami adharma, natyame nivritti. I know what's wrong, what I'm doing is wrong, I know that, but I can't stop myself. I can't stop myself. I want to do that. Kenapi devena, hridhisthitena kenapi devena yatha niyojito asmi tatha karomi. There is some force within me which forces me along in a, in, a, in a particular path. And as I'm forced in that path, I do that. Though I know it is wrong. Same problem. What Duryodhana is saying thousands of years ago, that Jonathan Haidt is saying, that uh, Robert Wright is saying, Sister Nivedita gives the solution. The solution is not intellectual education, that is secondary, training of the feeling, emotion. What I want, that I will be able to do, not what I understand. How emotion and decision making are related. Sister Nivedita also pointed out the importance for technical education, but she said something very interesting. She said, Technical education, very important for India, but it must not be divorced from theoretical education. She said to teach engineering skills without teaching physics and mathematics, it's like having a flower and we're taking it away from the plant, a flower blossom without any roots, a branch without the tree, it will not live. She gives a very interesting comparison. You teach skills, but you do not teach the theory behind it, then what will happen? It's like divorcing the hand from the eye and divorcing both hand and eye from the mind. This complete understanding, mind, senses, sense organs, motor organs. This complete uh, education. You see, technical skills, they flow from engineering skills, they flow from physics, they flow from chemistry, from the basic sciences. You, unless one gives importance to basic sciences and practical knowledge, the divorce between the two is fatal. Today we are suffering from it. Few years ago, um, director of, uh, at that time the director of um, IIT Chennai was telling me that uh, now there is this industry, um, uh, industry uh, institution at IIT and industry collaboration, university industry collaboration. So whatever skills the students need the, uh, the, in the industry, those are being taught in the institute. And he told me this is disastrous. What, what the industry is doing is they are passing on their tra training costs to the institute. Here we are supposed to teach fundamental skills and knowledge, not how to operate a particular machine in a particular company. 
in the name of industry education collaboration they are passing on what their responsibility to the institute we are supposed to teach science we are supposed to teach fundamental insights into the nature of the of, of, of the universe and then practical skills 100 years ago sister nivedita pointed this out you cannot divorce she gave tremendous importance for technical education but not divorced from basic science and she gave so much importance to research we just heard jagadish bosu how she encouraged jagadish bosu but also the tata institute even now the indian institute of science in bangalore is known as the tata institute and there if you go um, nivedita's contribution swami vivekananda in inspired tata to start an institute for fundamental research imagine a sanyasi in the 19th century a businessman two of them are getting together and the conclusion mutual conclusion is basic research in science in modern science is necessary for the country that led to the growth of the indian institute of science and nivedita's role is central because tata faced a lot of difficulties in starting it and sister nivedita helped i went to the indian institute of science and they were telling me how many of its graduates later on they established the uh, atomic research center the bhava atomic research center the uh, tifr then some of the iits they have their roots in the tata institute in bangalore and that has, has its roots in nivedita uh, tata and vivekananda you can see in one sense vivekananda is like a pioneer of indian science and technology today you can trace it back straight to vivekananda just a few ideas given by swami vivekananda another thing nivedita said the role of philanthropy in education one thing i'm amazed one thing i really i really like about united states that i enjoy their universities the public institutions universities museums libraries parks magnificent the importance that we give to temples in our country they give that imp- importance to universities in 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 their country in the west one of my favorite places in new york in manhattan is this uh, schwarzman research library uh, magnificent 4 million books a seven story building underground just to store the uh, books seven stories of books underground and all free not one dollar you have to pay them any any book you want and these are rare books which they will not lend you just, anybody can go make a card free again go and sit and read all day ask for a book they will get it there will be a screen that within 30 minutes your book is coming you wait the information will go down under underground there there are volunteers they will load the book there's a train book train the books will be loaded on that and you come upstairs and you can get your book and you study now my point is you know how it came not us government no if you go downstairs names are given Rock- rockefeller rockefeller and other families they are all top businessmen capitalists of those days carnegie rockefeller they are very rich people but they use their money for public benefit this spirit of philanthropy sister nivedita said at that time when there was not much wealth to be had in india she said businessmen should get together with educators and establish philanthropic education uh, institutes for the spread of mass education some of the most magnificent institutions in america are the libraries in all cities of america huge library system now it is because of internet we do not give so much importance to libraries but imagine just before internet what a great resource it is free for everybody not just students anybody who stays in that city you can simply go to that huge library in every city and you can access all the books so and all of this was made possible by philanthropy and sister nivedita pointed out at that time luckily now some spirit of philanthropy is coming up among indian industrialists i think the infosys foundation and all of that they are beginning to encourage sister nivedita pointed out 
that Indians have a sense of philanthropy, but it is religious philanthropy. Punno or Junkar. So I will give some donation to a temple. I will give some donation to, even now in USA, we see the rich Indian community, big temples, gorgeous temples. We say, how about making an endowment to a university? That connection has not yet come in the Indian mind. That is why the very concept of Shikhan Mandir, that is the idea. Education and religion are one and the same thing. Spirituality and education are one and the same thing. For Sister Nivedita, nation building and education were synonymous. You know Japa repeating the Japa mantra? Nivedita used to repeat the mantra on our Japa Mala, Bharat Bhasho, Bharat Bhasho, Bharat Bhasho. That was her mantra. And how would she convert her, her spiritual practice into reality? Through education. So money should flow to Mandir, correct. But which Mandir? Money should flow to Shikhan Mandir. To, to education, yes. So that was Nivedita's, one of the central ideas that uh, the, uh, the philanthropic spirit and education should come together. She also, I will end with this idea that education should be based on nationalistic spirit, not a narrow nationalism, but always based on your roots. First, local roots in your own culture and then be global. I heard a nice story yesterday. She was going to give a speech to some students. And when a train stopped, students were there to receive. I think in Medinipur, Asa. Um, and students, when she got down from the train, the students shouted, in those days, British India, they shouted, hip hip hurra, hip hip hurra. And she said, why are you shouting hip hip hurra? Uh, this is the English uh, uh, usage. You should say, Vahe Guru Ki Fateh, Vahe Guru Ki Khalsa. The Sikh, Sikh uh, slogan, she said, and she made them shout that. They have roots in your own culture first, and then international, but not in a narrow sense. She wanted roots in a synthetic Indian culture, 